great. Okay. As usual with our sessions, um, we've got a couple of polls that we run in our glaucoma support groups. Um, if you're able to access them, that would be amazing. If not, please don't worry. We use these polls just to understand a little bit about how much people are gaining from these sessions. They are a click uh, button on Zoom. Um, if you're watching via Facebook, unfortunately, Facebook um, doesn't allow polls to run. Um, but we are hoping to get a little bit of an idea about what people know to start with. Um, hopefully, the, as I say, the poll is accessible to you. If it's not, please don't worry. Um, we hope that you can still sit back, relax and, and enjoy what there is to find out today about Charles Bonnet. I'm just going to give it uh, a few minutes because I'm aware that it may need a little bit of navigation. I will also just take um, a moment to uh, let you guys know um, that we have been contacted by one of the universities in London um, who are currently taking part in some research about Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, they are trying to seek um, experience, I think, from different people about their experience of living with Charles Bonnet. Um, I will give more information about that research at the end of the talk so I can tell you kind of exactly what is involved. Um, but just to put it out there, on people's radar that it's absolutely not compulsory um, and it isn't related to this webinar at all um, but there are opportunities for research um, coming up so if people are keen to get involved they can get in touch with me um, afterwards and and we can get you in touch with the researchers as well fabulous I am going to end this poll now. We will run the same poll again at the end of the session so we can see if people have, have learned anything. Um, as I say, if you haven't been able to, to um, vote or take part in the poll, please don't worry. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and I am going to hand over to Judith Potts and Judith has joined us today she's the uh, founder and CEO of organization charity Esme's Umbrella which provides support for people with Charles Bonnet syndrome and we're absolutely delighted that she's able to join us this evening um, to enlighten us and and share the world of, of Charles Bonnet with us so thank you ever so much Judith for for joining us this evening I am going to try and make you big there we are spotlight you oh, <laughs> um, and I'm going to hide and yes take it away Thanks so much for joining us all right well thank you so much for inviting me it's absolutely lovely to be here it does make me smile when you call me chief executive officer because Esme's umbrella is actually only me so I'm it's a bit like being captain of a canoe really <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Judith Potts and I am the founder of Esme's Umbrella. And the two questions that I'm always asked are, why Umbrella and who was Esme? Well, when I decided to do something about Charles Bonnet syndrome, I chose the logo of an umbrella to shelter everyone who develops this condition and researchers and doctors and everybody else too. And Esme, well, Esme was my mum and it was because of her experience of Charles Bonnet syndrome that I decided something should be done. She was, it was a long time ago now, she was in her early nineties and lived a very independent life, uh, baked her own chocolate brownies, which were very famous in the family. Uh, completed correctly the Telegraph cryptic crossword every day. I knew she was losing her sight, but in those days I knew nothing at all about sight loss. And I did not realize that the glaucoma that she had was actually taking much more of her sight than I realized she was very, very good at compensating. And all was going fine. She was living, as I say, on her own and enjoying life until one day she said to me, I do wish these people would get off my sofa. Well, of course, there wasn't anybody sitting on her sofa. And while I was taking a breath to think how on earth I was going to answer this, she said, and 
there is an Edwardian street child who follows me everywhere and a hideous gargoyle-like creature that jumps from table to chair and sometimes the whole room or garden morphs into an alien place. Well, of course, I had absolutely no idea what could be wrong with her. My immediate thought, as was hers, was the word dementia, which was hanging between us in the air. But then I thought, no, 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 it can't be that because of this telegraph crossword and also her whole demeanor. At that moment, she didn't feel too anxious and so I left her and went home and with the most enormous piece of luck that very day I found buried in the health pages of a newspaper a tiny paragraph describing a condition which developed after sight loss and it was called Charles Bonnet syndrome and I thought that's what she's got so I rang her said don't worry everything will be fine I will talk to your doctor and I rang her ophthalmologist who refused, point blank, to discuss it with me. Her GP would never heard of it, her optometrist likewise. So I thought, what am I going to do? And I went onto the internet. I know we're always told not to, but that seemed like a good idea at the time. And there I found Professor Dominic Fitch at King's College London, who is still the sole globally acknowledged expert in Charles Bonnet syndrome. So, I thought, right, I'm going to go and see him. And at that time, I was writing a health column for The Telegraph, which actually was all about cancer after a diagnosis I had had. But I was so determined to do something that I called him up and he said, yes, please. And I went to see him. And he then explained to me exactly what Charles Bonnet syndrome is. And this is what he said. When you have full sight, there are messages which run all the time from the eye to the brain, the retina in the eye to the visual cortex in the brain. The eye acts like a camera and the brain interprets what it is you're seeing. When sight diminishes and you lose over 60%, those messages slow right down or stop entirely. And that leaves the brain with nothing to interpret. So for some reason that we still don't understand, the brain doesn't quieten down, it fires up and creates its own images. And what is seen depends on which part of the brain is firing at that moment. He also said to me, the one very important thing which we all have to remember is that this is not a mental health condition. It's caused entirely by loss of sight. So I went away back to my desk and I wrote the first ever column about Charles Bonnet syndrome and I was inundated with people who just wanted to tell me their story, wanted more information or were just relieved to discover it wasn't a mental health issue. The time went on. Um, CBS became very bad for Esme. As she grew older, she found it much more difficult to cope with and it stayed with her for the rest of her life. After she died, I continued to write about CBS and I one day received an email from a professor at a university in New York who told me the story of her mother who had been hallucinating worms and slugs on her food and in her drink and the doctor, never heard of CBS, so said, this lady has dementia, she needs to go into a special unit. And in she went, protesting, but in she went. She simply could not get past those worms and slugs, and she stopped eating and drinking with very tragic consequences. And that is what made me decide I had to do something. So in 2015, almost seven years ago, on the 16th of November, I launched Esme's Umbrella, at the House of Commons. And since then, it has been a charity. No, it hasn't, it's been a campaign. It's been a charity since last year, since last December. And when I turned it into a charity, I had three aims, and they were the same ones I'd had at the very beginning. To raise awareness of Charles Bonnet syndrome, to find ways to support people who develop the condition and their families and friends, and to source funding for research. So having launched, I then looked around to see what really needed 
apart from raising awareness to be done. And of course, it was both support and research. And the first thing that happened was that Michelle Acton, who at that time was chief executive of Fight for Sight, the big sight research charity, came to me and said, would you like a restricted fund held by Fight for Sight and any money you gather can go into that fund and will only be used for CBS research. And I said, yes, that would be wonderful. And that is exactly what happened. And it was from that fund that the first piece of Esme's umbrella research happened. And that was at Newcastle University led by Kat De Silva Morgan, doctor now. Um, and she was comparing the brains of people with sight loss and CBS against those with sight loss who don't develop it, because we do know there are some, and we don't know why. There is a difference in the brains. Her, her research is about to be published. I am not sure what it is, except that she has told me that it's not what we all think. It's not that people with CBS have more excitable brains. Apparently, that's not so. But until it's published, I can't tell you any more than that. But that was the first piece of research. So then I thought, now, CBS is known as a side effect of sight loss, and it shouldn't be. So with the help of a very eminent ophthalmologist here, Professor Andrew Dick, and another in America, Dr. August Kohlenbrander, we approached the World Health Organization and explained that we needed a code for Charles Bonnet syndrome in its taxonomy of diseases and conditions called ICD-11. And finally, they agreed. They refused to take the word temporary out, but I will be back to these people in Geneva in the next year or so to see if I can get that removed because we know that CBS is not temporary. It can be for some people, but not for everybody. So now we have uh, CBS as a condition in its own right. And I am now looking to the NHS to create a proper pathway for diagnosis and treatment. At the moment, the only clinic in the whole world is run by Professor Dominic Fitch at King's College London, and that has to change. The other thing I've been working on is to try and persuade ophthalmologists and optometrists to warn their patients who have diminishing eyesight that CBS might develop. We know that if a patient has that warning, when the first hallucination appears, they instantly know what it is and they don't think they're losing their mind. And that way, the outcome for that patient is very much better. We have proved that and we need to persuade ophthalmologists and optometrists to do that. Both colleges, both the Royal College of Ophthalmologists and the College of Optometrists have both agreed with me and changed their guidelines, but not everybody is adhering to them. But I will keep banging on about it. The other set of people, of course, are the GPs who know absolutely nothing about this. Um, and I am working very hard on them. Awareness has also been raised by me writing for magazines, papers, uh, scientific journals, even adding my name to research projects, which is great. Uh, but two very important things happened. One, the scriptwriters of Coronation Street came to me and asked if I would help them create a storyline about a character with Charles Bonnet syndrome. And so this I did. There were eight episodes. When the episode was aired that explained what was wrong with the character, we had 1,800 people contact us. So I knew that it worked. And then a few weeks ago, there was an episode of Doc Martin in which CBS featured too. So we are slowly, slowly pushing it upwards and centre stage, which is where, of course, it should be. So that is raising awareness, um, creating ways to support people. Well, I, first of all, uh, persuaded some low vision charities around the country to run support groups. They were called Esme Room support groups. And these enabled people with CBS to meet together, to find that reassurance, to know they're not alone, 
and to exchange their experiences and their coping strategies. Having just about six already in the pipeline, along came COVID-19 and all of those had to change. They all closed and that was that. However, within one week of lockdown, it became very obvious that people with CBS were having a particularly difficult time. What was happening was their CBS episodes were becoming very much more frequent and what they were seeing was much more frightening. So out of the pandemic came Esme's Friends groups. And these are groups like this one tonight, online or on the telephone. We have, I think, 33 at the moment, seven of which are run by the RNIB and the others by local low vision charities, apart from one in Manchester, which is run by a wonderful young woman called Nina Chesworth, who lives with Charles Bonnie syndrome every waking hour. She is a young mum and uh, she has retrained as a holistic therapist and is trying to help people cope in the way that she has managed to find a way to cope for herself. She went out and did a 100 mile walk, she is totally blind, and raised enough money to actually produce a pilot project called CAM, which is Knowledge, Acceptance and Management of Charles Bonny Syndrome. And uh, the first pilot project of that is running and uh, we will learn a lot from it and then we hope to run some more. And if anybody is interested in um, taking part in the next one, please let me know or let Robin know and she can let me know. So the other thing I want to do and haven't managed yet is to um, find funding for counsellors. Uh, preferably people who are visually impaired themselves and possibly even have CBS, because there are some people who find CBS intolerable and counselling is really the only way forward. The Macula Society run counsellors, I think, but only in, in groups. Um, but people tell me what they want is one-to-one -one counselling and local, so they can actually go if they want to, to sit face-to-face -face with the counsellor. So that's something that I have in mind for the future and many, many more Esme's Friends groups. And then we come to research. Well, after that very first piece of research, um, we had a couple of years uh, and then I managed to get some more money and I talked to Fight for Sight and we put out a call for another researcher and we got five people who were interested. So what we did, we took my money, which was tiny, and split it into two. And then we, we talked to other charities who gave money to add. So we had two pots of money. The first pot went to the Nuffield Center for Neurosciences at Oxford University. And what they have done is they've taken the research from Newcastle a stage further. They are sitting people with CBS under a very sophisticated scanner and watching to see what happens before, during and after the hallucination. And uh, the second pot of money. Oh, and by the way, what they wonder is if there is a higher pathway for, uh, from the eye to the brain, um, as well as the one that I talked about earlier. And in that pathway, could there be images held of some kind? We don't know. Whether they'll be able to find out, I don't know, but let's hope they do. They also wonder whether there is a chemical being introduced into the brain before the hallucination appears. More of that a bit later. So the second pot of money um, went to Dr. Matt Dunn at Cardiff University with some money from the Welsh government. And Dr. Dunn is looking at peripheral vision to see again whether it's more suggestible, whether there are images held there. Again, we won't know probably till 2023 the result of that, but that is very important as well. Um, then I talked about uh, isolation and stress and fever we know too, make CBS worse as happened during the pandemic. Professor Maria Mustaji, who is a consultant ophthalmologist at both Moorfields and Great Ormond Street and a, a genetic researcher at the Francis Crick Institute, 
She and a psychologist called Dr. Lee Jones have now proved that isolation and stress make CBS worse. So their research paper has been published, peer reviewed and published, and it is there now for everyone to see. So that has been very, very good. And they then asked me if they could undertake some more research. And the one thing that I've always been worried about are children. If I know what it's like having watched Esme when an adult develops this condition, but what must it be like when a child suddenly starts to hallucinate? So first of all, we had to prove prevalence in children because up till then everybody said, no, children don't get it. Oh yes, they do. And uh, Professor Musaji has done that by looking at the records of uh, children in her pediatric clinics. And she has discovered that yes, children have talked about hallucinations. So she wrote to her fellow pediatric ophthalmologists and asked them if they were warning the children. And the answer was no. So now they will be. And she and Dr. Lee Jones have now taken it a step further and they are conducting a study to see the impact that CBS has on the child who develops it and on the child's family. And that I am so pleased about and I know will be incredibly useful when that uh, report is written. Then we have uh, a, um, a researcher at Manchester University, uh, a PhD girl actually, and she is doing a piece of work to see if there's some way we can prevent people with CBS from falling over, because this happens very often. Even if you know that the sudden appearance of a tiger is not real, you still instinctively try and move out of the way. And that means you either overbalance or you fall over something that's actually there. Now, if you hurt yourself, this will take you to the GP or the hospital doctor, where even if you say, I have Charles Bonnet syndrome, they've never heard of it, and they will send you down the psych route. And that is, first of all, an incredible waste of NHS resources, and secondly, awful and terribly distressing for the patient. So if we can come up with a way of helping people to be very careful and not to fall over, that will be of great help too. Um, there is, uh, I think Beth might actually be on this, um, this at, at this meeting tonight, but there is some research happening at um, City University London and Anglia Ruskin University, which is to find out much more about the impact that CBS has on um, the person who develops it. And again, what happens before, during, and after uh, the hallucination. So there is quite a lot of work being done, but I think my probably my favorite piece of research is being done for me by the medical detection dogs. Now I'm sure you've heard of these amazing dogs who can sniff cancer far better than any human test, and who also are alert dogs for conditions like um, epilepsy or diabetes or Addison's disease, one of the conditions where the state of the body changes and um, an intervention with medication is required to stop a disaster. Well, I heard that a guide dog was warning her owner before his CBS episode began. She put her head on his lap and stayed there until she knew it had finished. So I used to write a great deal um, in my Telegraph column about the medical detection dogs and their ability to sniff cancer. And so I called Dr. Claire Guest, who leads the charity. I told her about CBS and I asked her if she thought it was possible. Did she think this dog was actually able to do this? And the first thing she said was exactly what they told me at Oxford. She said, I suspect there is a chemical being introduced into the brain, which is changing the odor of the person's skin. And that is what the dog is detecting. So I said, would you do some research? And she said, yes. And so she and her team are 
trying to find out how soon before the hallucination this skin odour changes. And that ties up very nicely with the Oxford research. We have also put out a call just recently. Uh, we have another very tiny grant of £15,000 for somebody. And we've had three people um, respond. So by the 16th of November, which is Charles Bonnet Syndrome Awareness Day, we ought to have another piece of research to announce. Of course, what we really need is a million pounds so that we can actually do some serious research and find out if we can get some medication. Because at the moment, there is no CBS specific medication. There is medication for conditions like epilepsy, like dementia. It doesn't mean that you have got either of those, but sometimes for some people that might work. <clears throat> but what we really need is a proper study to see if we can find some form of therapy. Now, the Macular Society uh, did a piece of research at Newcastle University led by uh, Professor, Professor Paul John Taylor, no, John Paul Taylor, get his name right. Um, and this, um, they used, uh, I have to get this right, they used repetitive transcranial uh, uh, magnetic brain stimulation. I have to try and learn that. Um, and they introduced that into the brain and it stopped the hallucinations. But it was a tiny study and I would really love it if the Macular Society could go on and do a much bigger study to see if there's some way we can um, use that and the people with CBS can be helped. So that is where we are um, with that. I can tell you a couple more things. One is that CBS, as I said, is made worse by isolation, by stress and by fever. So if you get a cold, or if you get um, COVID, you will find that CBS does get worse. It should get better when you get better. The second thing is that medication taken for other conditions sometimes makes CBS worse too. And the biggest culprit in that is a, a drug called omeprazole. Any of those proton pump inhibitors, which are taken for gastric problems, will make CBS worse. And so it's a very good idea if you're taking any of those, not to stop taking them, but to go to the GP and ask for a review of your medication and perhaps something alternative that won't make your CBS worse. Um, what else can I tell you? I can tell you that people see all sorts of different things. I, I started a list when I, seven years ago, and gave up after six months because the list was just endless. Mostly people see other humans, um, not Professor Fitch will tell you dead relatives, but sometimes people like to feel that that's what they're seeing. Uh, but the people that are seen tend to be wearing costume of some kind, usually, if not always, with a hat or headdress, uh, medieval costume, Edwardian, my mother saw the Edwardian child, um, uh, Middle Eastern and uh, military is very popular. Um, I know somebody who sees a First World War soldier standing in the corner of the room. Um, he's got quite used to that now, but for other people having armies marching through their house is, is not easy at all to cope with uh, and terribly distressing. Apart from people, animals, insects, uh, birds, uh, all anything you can think of, all the way through to patterns, words, maps, musical notes, numbers. And then sometimes people tell me the whole room or the whole garden, in my mother's case, uh, changes. And she found herself in the middle of an Edwardian funeral procession, the clergy in their red cassocks and um, the horses with the black, the black plumes. Uh, and people find themselves sometimes at the top of the stairs and suddenly it's a waterfall. Um, sometimes people will walk across a room and suddenly they're in the middle of a river. All sorts of strange things happen. It is a, a weirdly fascinating 
but very distressing and debilitating condition. Now, if you'd like to ask me questions, please do. Thank you ever so much. I'm just going to come off um, off being hidden uh, and I'll remove the spotlight so we can we can see each other again. Thank you so much for that. Yes, as Judith said, please, please do ask questions. Um, there's a Q&A function on Zoom. There's comments functions on um, on Facebook. Please do send questions in. I have got a few questions uh, to kick us off with, if that is OK, Judith. Um, my yeah. my first question was kind of when was CBS first recognised? Uh, you said that there was this uh, expert that you went to see when you first discovered it. But kind of when was it first identified as, as a medical condition? It was first identified by Charles Bonnet himself. In, he documented what was happening to his grandfather, Charles Lulin. They lived in an apartment in Geneva uh, in 1760. And absolutely nothing happened. He knew his grandfather uh, was, as he put, of sound mind. Um, and he thought it must be something to do with his sight because he'd had a cataract uh, operation. Can you imagine how that must, awful that must have been in 1760? And he was left with virtually no sight at all. Um, and so Charles Bonnet was um, a, a naturalist, a lawyer, a philosopher, and he just knew it must be something to do with his grandfather's sight. So he documented the fact that his grandfather was seeing carriages going through the apartment, um, the tapestries on the walls were changing, armies of people were marching through in strange uniforms. And uh, he put all this down and nothing happened until about 1930, when a doctor, again, I think in Switzerland, uh, dug up this information because he'd had a few patients talk about hallucinations. And um, he decided to call it Charles Bonnet syndrome. Then, I think there might have been a little something in the 1960s, but no research at all until Professor Fitch began his research in the 1990s. And I think what happened was because people self-diagnose immediately thinking they're losing their mind, they didn't share this information with anybody, particularly doctors, because in those days they would have simply taken them and locked them away. And um, I think because of that, several myths grew up around the condition. One, that it only happened to the elderly. Two, that it would all go away after 18 months. And three, that people only saw very pleasant things. And I think, again, that's because patients, if they did say anything, said, oh, no, no, it's absolutely fine. I don't mind at all. I see lovely bunches of flowers. Whereas, in fact, they were probably seeing things that were pretty hideous. That's great. Thank you. Um, we've had a question come in that is asking, how long do hallucinations last when people are having Charles Bonnet hallucinations? Kind of what's the, the time scale that they're lasting? For? Well, every single person is different. So it's very difficult. It, it can last seconds or it can last an hour. Um, it just depends. Um, sometimes people it, it, sometimes people enjoy them I know one um, lady who told me that she had lost her sight six years ago no light perception at all and had not seen color for six years when suddenly Charles Bonnet syndrome leapt into action and she now sees what she describes as gardening documentaries but they're so vivid and clear that or she can actually see a drop of rain on a leaf but the problem is a, she doesn't know when they're going to happen, and B, she doesn't know how long they're going to last. And, oh, by the way, um, they are always silent. There is no other sense involved. Okay, that's really interesting. That's that's great. And, and to, if people have very quick hallucinations or very long hallucinations, is it kind of, does it tend to be consistent? You know, will it, does it vary between person or in one person might they have very short ones and then very long ones? Some people have the same one all the time and some people have different ones um, every day. Uh, again, people I speak to tell me 
um, oh goodness, don't, don't ask me what I see. I see absolutely everything. And other people will be very specific like this First World War soldier. Um, so it's very hard to answer these questions because literally everybody's experience is different. That make yeah, absolutely makes sense. Um, we've had another question come in saying, does the patient ever know when a hallucination might be about to occur? So we've, obviously you mentioned about the dogs, but can, can, can people tell before they happen? I have not yet spoken to anybody who can. Um, no, it's, it, it's not like a hot flush. <laughs> um, it, I, don't think, I don't think they know. It just suddenly happens. Which is why when, when it does, and it's something like um, a mouse sitting on the floor, it comes as a surprise and is so easy to think, well, oh gosh, we've got mice. But actually, it's an hallucination. But the, but there are coping strategies, so you can check um, by the coping strategies are things like shunting your brain into another gear, so reaching out towards um, the hallucination, uh, clicking your fingers, clapping your hands, standing up, sitting down, walking about. There's an eye exercise on my website which Professor Fitch has invented. Um, is anything to, to distract the brain. And the other thing about Charles Bonnet syndrome is that it tends to kick in if you're very relaxed. So just before you go to sleep, just as you wake up in the morning, or the favorite is if you're a passenger in a car where you have nothing to do, um, you're, you are, your brain is just not, not working then because you can't see anything and uh, the driver is driving. So that's when I say, really annoy the driver by singing or talking to them or doing something because that will stop. Because as passengers in cars, the hallucinations tend to be enormous. So you see giant trucks coming towards you. You see that you're about to drive into a cliff or you're the ocean, the waves of the ocean are about to come over you. Um, why that should be, I don't know, but Everybody that I've spoken to who's explained about being a passenger in a car, they've all said they're giant things. That's really interesting. We've also had a, a question on here saying, do you have any, you, you just touched on tips that people can do themselves when they're experiencing these hallucinations or, or to gauge whether they are hallucinations or not. Um, but do you have any tips to support somebody when they're experiencing a hallucination? So if they're the carer of somebody or... yeah. Yes, um, I, I found with, with Esme, and this is something I, I always say to people, if you ask them about, don't say, which I started to do, obviously, and then learned better. Um, well, they're not there, are they? You know, pull yourself together. Don't, don't be silly. No, you go along with it and you say, well, tell me about it. What does it look like? And get them to describe the hallucination write it down and then talk it back to them. And that is really helpful because they then think, oh gosh, yes, it was only a hallucination. But at the time, they're so vivid and clear and real and can be very, very upsetting that it needs a, a kind of reality check. Uh, some people draw what they, if they've got a bit of sight left, they draw what they see or they paint. Um, or they record, if there's no one to write it down, they, they record into a phone what they've just seen and again, play it back to themselves. But just that reassurance, you can say, now you, you know that's not there, don't you? But tell me, what does it look like? And expressing an interest does help. It's very difficult and it, it is, it can be, a little bit like looking after someone with dementia because you do have to keep saying, no, it's okay, there's no fire in the corner. But was it a big fire? What did it look like? You have to keep saying that to reassure the person because, because they're so real. And, and, and you know, people ring the police, they ring the fire brigade because it looks so real. If, if it's fire, one lady told me that she had a, um, like a glass window in her door. And she used to see fire the other side and she called the fire brigade twice. And they said, look, if you do this again, we're not coming. 
So she was terrified. So she then thought, if I touch the door, if there really is fire on the other side, the door will be hot. So little things like that are quite helpful. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's really great. Um, that's that's really useful. We've had another question come in saying, can you see them if your eyes are closed? Yes, you can. Yes, they don't go away. It doesn't matter if your eyes are open or closed because it's coming from the brain. So it's there in front of you, whether your eyes are closed or not. You can try and trick the brain. Some people go to sleep with three um, eye, what are they called? eye things that you put on um but i don't I, I some people say that works but but i but the brain is a very clever uh muscle and will um overcome anything put in its way if it's determined enough that's great um and and somebody's asked does it tend to worsen over time again it's different for everybody I think if it starts with patterns and then progresses to people or animals or whatever, it will probably stay at that. Um, if it doesn't progress and all you see are things like a kaleidoscope um, and it doesn't progress to anything else, then it probably will just hang on to that. But again, everybody is different. And for some people it will go away. Um, and for others, it will stay for years. I mean, I've spoken to people who've had it for 30 years. You learn to live with it, they tell me. That's great. Um, you mentioned Esme's friends groups um, and that there's 33 yeah. kind of groups running. How can people find out about them? Kind of, And, and do they have to be location specific or can anyone well, access them? They, it, 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 this depends a little bit on the local low vision charity who's running it. If they don't mind taking people from different parts of the country, that's fine. There is a list on my website, or if you email, if, if somebody wants to join one, if they email me, I can put them in touch and refer them to their local one, if there is one. Um, otherwise, the RNIB, uh, they run seven. Uh, and it's quite interesting, actually, because when I first asked them, uh, or no, I first told them, actually, that I was going to do this, um, Esme's Friends Group, they immediately said, oh, well, we're, we're going to run one, we're going to run one. <clears throat> and now they run seven. And when initially they said, well, there won't be a big take up. So, you know, I think you'll find it difficult. And I thought, well, OK, fine. But no, uh, now they've had to eat their words. And are the RNIB ones national? So can people join them those are from anywhere? Those, those are national, yes. Great. Those are national. The, the local ones we, we thought were a really good idea because um, people could then meet each other if they wanted to. There are no full names given. It's just your first name. Um, but if you wanted to meet somebody and have a cup of coffee or whatever outside of the groups, then local ones are better for that. Absolutely. Um, we've just had a, a comment saying, could we have the website details? So I will absolutely share the website details. That's not a problem at all. Um, somebody's asked, can the hallucinations happen more than once in a day? Yes, they can. Yes, they absolutely can. Um, they might be different or they might be the same, but they can, yeah. Great. Um, and we've also been asked, is there any idea of the incidence of Charles Bonnet in the population that's undiagnosed? Oh, that's undiagnosed. Well, well, if I tell you that we think there are probably at least a million people in the UK alone um, who live with the condition, that is, I think, half of the number of people with sight loss. I suspect that there are another few hundred thousand who just don't. Now, it could be they don't say anything because they know what it is and they handle it perfectly well. Um, 
it would be very useful if everybody told us because we would like to have a proper figure of prevalence. But um, at the moment, uh, we don't. But Professor Fitch has worked out the million by looking at the number of people who have macular disease, which is the most common, obviously, sight loss uh, condition, and then adding others. So you can get this if you have stroke, if you have cancer of the eye, if you have an accident to the eye, uh, if you have diabetic retinopathy, so if you have diabetes, if you have optic neuritis, so that is um, that comes with MS. So there are lots of reasons, um, not just sight, not just an eye condition. If something else takes your sight or damages the optic nerve or optic pathway. Great, that's really useful. Um, I have just put in the chat for anyone that the chat is accessible uh, to the um, website for Esme's umbrella. It is charlesbonnetsyndrome.uk. I hope that's right, Esme. <laughs> um, Judith, is that? Uh, that's so right. It's charlesbonnetsyndrome.uk. UK is no code, it's just .uk. That's great. Um, and if anybody doesn't get that down or is not able to access the chat, um, I will make sure that it's on our Facebook um, and, and please do get in touch with me as well. Um, my details are on all of the joining information. So if anybody needs anything afterwards, please, please let me know. Um, there was just a couple of other things to ask, and I'm going to ask a really ignorant question here because I um, was fascinated in what you were saying about the early detection with dogs. Um, and I guess my question is, what what benefit will people get from knowing in advance that their hallucinations are coming? Well, they can prepare for it. Uh, it's It's being taken by surprise that is so difficult for people. So if you're crossing a road and suddenly you're faced with a tiger or a brick wall or a, something like that, it's, it's what, what do you do? But if, if, a, if a, a guide dog or an, 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 an alert dog warns you, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen these dogs in action, but I remember going to um, the House of Commons actually to, to see them demonstrate to the, to the members of parliament. And standing behind me was a man with diabetes. And halfway through, we were watching the dogs. I noticed out of the corner of my eye, his dog jumped up on him and patted him on the arm. And he took out of his pocket a test kit, pricked his finger, did his test, gave himself what was necessary. The dog sat down again. And so he, he knew he was safe with that dog. And I think if we could, if we could find something to warn people it was about to happen, that would be of great help and wouldn't be so startling, particularly for the elderly. It's very, very difficult for the elderly to, to um, I mean, my mother, she kind of knew they weren't real, but as she got into her, she died at 97. And in those last couple of years, it was very hard for her to accept that this crying child, because it was a tear-stained child that followed her, was not in need of comfort. And of course, every time she went to comfort the child, it disappeared. And that's spooky. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's spooky for any anyone, but it's particularly spooky for an elderly person. Yeah, no, I absolutely understand that. Um, you mentioned that, um, was it CATS research is being published soon? Um, yes. That, that there's, Cat when, do, you, do you know when that's being published? Um, uh, any minute now is all I can tell you. Um, it may already have been. I, I, I had to get the money for her. What I didn't understand, not being a medical person, was that a young researcher has to pay for her own research to be published. It could be peer reviewed for free by whoever does this, but to have it published, they have to pay themselves. And so I didn't realize this. So we waited quite some time and I kept saying, Where, why isn't this published? And finally, she said, because I don't have the money. So I actually got TPT, to Thomas Bocklington Trust and Fight for Sight to share the cost. So, but you know, these things take forever. So I think it should be any minute now. 
that's great um I, I will for everybody who's listening i will kind of um endeavor to find find that so again we can share it with people because i know that um many people will be interested in in what's been said for that that's amazing um i we've had a, a message and one that's come through being liked saying what an extremely interesting talk and thank you so much and i would absolutely echo that um if anybody does have any last questions please do send them in um i was just going to share with you um judith mentioned the uh, research that um city university are doing in london and they have just sent me over a little bit of information to share with you. Um, they have said that scientists are wanting to understand more about how visual hallucinations caused by sight loss impact the daily lives of those affected. If you have experienced Charles Bonnet syndrome and you could you could help researchers at City University of London by completing a short questionnaire. The researchers hope the information that they receive will help them to further understand the condition, which can cause people with sight loss to see things which aren't there. It's hoped that findings could also support future research into treatments for the condition. Bethany, one of the researchers, said, for the discovery of new treatments and therapies, a lot of information is needed before further research can take place. That is why questionnaires like this are so important. We'd love to hear from anyone affected by CBS and hope this research could improve their lives as well as lives of others who experience visual hallucinations. If anybody um, who's on the webinar this evening is interested in taking part in that research, please do get in touch with us and I will put you in touch um, with, with Bethany who is um, who got in contact with us so that we can get you guys uh, all hooked up and um, hopefully it really boosts uh, the number of people who are responding to that to that research because it it um it it's really valuable uh, i'm sure uh, judith will echo that that more is being done in these fields so that um we can understand it a little better and and hopefully provide better support for people and could i just add yeah. that the, that the uk is the only country in the world doing any research wow so we need you even more <laughs> no on, I, I i don't want to pressure people there is absolutely no obligation um but bethany, bethany is lovely by the way she's she's very she's young and she's very gentle and she's very sweet and the questions are very easy and she can do it on the phone great yep so i i know um in her information she has talked about making sure that it is accessible so um often we get people after these events saying what can i do to help um so if you are interested then that is there um i am going to launch the second poll for this evening um there is still an opportunity if anybody wants to add any other questions before we disappear um, and I will also just share some information about the um, upcoming sessions that we've got uh, in terms of Glaucoma UK support groups. So um, I am just I am sharing uh, a slide again for those of you who are able to see that. For those who aren't, I will read it all out. So please um, don't feel like you're missing out on anything. Um, we do have our helpline at Glaucoma UK. If you uh, experience Charles Bonnet or have any other questions relating to your glaucoma and you would like to get in touch with us, please do call the helpline or drop them an email. Their phone number is 01233 648170. That's 01233 648170. And they have an email address which is helpline at glaucoma.uk. And our phone lines are open Monday to Friday, 9 30 a.m. until 5 o'clock. We have got three sessions coming up between now and Christmas, um, all relating to glaucoma. The one that is coming up next is on the 16th of November between 7 and 8 p.m. And that is titled Living with Glaucoma, Tips and Tricks from a Person with Glaucoma. Our session after that is on the 28th of November. And the, again, that's 7 until 8 o'clock and is titled glaucoma and driving and we're looking at all kinds of frequently asked questions around glaucoma and driving 
And our last session before Christmas is on the 14th of December. Again, seven until eight in the evening. And that's all about primary open angle glaucoma. I would like to say a huge thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you to everybody who's taken part in our poll and an absolutely enormous thank you to Judith for, for joining us and for sharing all your wonderful expertise um, with us. If anybody has any questions for Judith afterwards um, or any questions, please do use use the esme umbrella website get in touch with us um and and we can try and do what we can to get answers for you um we really hope that you sorry go on judith robin i just want to say one more thing the 16th Absolutely. of november is charles bonnie syndrome awareness day and there is a donate button on the website <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, that's that's been absolutely wonderful. I hope everybody has learned as much as I have from the session uh, this evening. I know that um, I have taken a lot, a lot from it. So um, thank you ever so much for joining us. I really hope people will join us again for our future sessions. And um, there will be an email coming around afterwards uh, with a SurveyMonkey link. And I know everybody's always really fed up of, of giving feedback, but I promise you, we do look at every single one of your answers and try and make our sessions as informative as possible. And so that everybody is getting as much out of them as possible. So please, if you are able to, do take the time to fill in that survey um, so that we can make these sessions the best they can be. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you again to Judith. Take care, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye.